I was in the infantry, and it was called the Black Hawk Division also. We started out in, in the middle of France, and then right after, we were committed right after the bulge. And then we, uh, my unit was trained to go to, to go to attack the East Coast. We were doing these, this, doing uh, maneuvers with the Marine Corps and the Navy and of course the Army. And then they, Eisenhower felt need that there was more, there was need for troops in Europe and that they needed another division. So they called our division over there to go to, to, uh, to be in Europe. They, they were being, the uh, soldiers were being depleted, killed out, so and that was the, the reason for that. I would, went right through school and I told them that I would go in as soon as I was, well, I was finished school. They, they allowed me to go in. I, I was, in fact, drafted, but I told them that I would, I could uh, go ahead and, and en enlist but I didn't think that was necessary when I was going right away anyway. I'd been around to uh, out of state, Texas and Arkansas and Mississippi, all around the, that air, that, but we didn't go much. We, there was no opportunity to, to travel like now. Before Pearl Harbor, well, we knew the war, the war was going on in Europe and I knew eventually that I would have to serve. And I was going to school at the time and trying to get my degree and I had to go to Louisiana Tech after having been at LSU because it, I ran out of funds. I was working and my, my school job gave out and I went to Ruston where I was employed. We knew very much it was going to be because it, the, the, I was studying French at the time in, in school and, and had uh, somewhat uh, become interested in it and learned to speak it a little bit, you know, in the first year. And so I knew that when they captured Paris, uh, when they entered, entered France, the Germans entered uh, Holland and already captured Holland and were coming in and, into France and Paris, I knew that my time would be very soon. And so it, wasn't, it was at the end of that year that I had to go. I, I completed all my, my degree work before I left. They allowed me to do that, which I was very grateful for because I had a complete degree before I went away. But that day I was, and a Sunday afternoon I was out on the, the at, at uh, on the campus there uh, sunning a little bit. Well, I heard about it, but there, everybody started to talk about it. Then the next morning we, we gathered in and they, that was when Roosevelt gave his great speech, in, infin, in, the infin, infamy, what's the in, The day that we shall live in infamy. The infamy, yes, that, that wonderful speech that he made. We all heard it, and I knew it, it, my, my, my termination was a few days later. I had, had my degree, and then I went on into the service. I did not want to go in the Air Force. A lot of people wanted to go to be flyers. So I, I didn't want that because I, I don't want to get off the, I don't like to fly. I wanted to keep my feet solid on the ground, so infantry suited me fine. That or field artillery, and I, I uh, it's better to have your own rifle and to have a big, big field artillery piece to worry with. Well, I knew what it was. I'd studied war. I'd studied about war, and I had a very good friend who told me about it. He was an infantry soldier, too. He told me much of the experiences that I absolutely ex found exactly the way that he told it about it. The first days, yes, they were pretty gruesome, you know, and we were taken into this place down in Louisiana where we were given our, we were sworn in and of course given a uniform and things, it had to be, it didn't, didn't fit exactly right, but it didn't matter too much. <laughs> But we finally got it to fit, and anyway, uh, we, we we were sent off to to camp over in, in South Carolina, uh, getting up early and and drilling, starting to drill, and the the uh, getting used to the service and exercising and getting up at five o'clock in the morning and all of that kind of stuff and going on hikes and trips and and it, I, I didn't see the point of it at first. Of course, you know later you do because it. You think, well, as strong as I can be, I want to be because I've got I've got to take care of myself, 
and maybe take care of others as well, you know. When we first got there, we had to use uh, uh, wooden rifles to, to, to do the maneuvers with, you know. It was very interesting. And so uh, that was that was the about that. And I remember when we received rifles. I thought it was a good thing to get them because they were quite heavy. They were 15 pounds, weighed 15 pounds. And of course, we had to use had to do the the training, the ritual and in, in training that you do the rigidness of, of handling that rep weapon, which I was very proud of. I learned to do it quite well. I was I learned to be very fancy with it. By being able to maneuver it, and, you know, come come to be a real what I call a real straight up, shown off soldier. They sent me to uh, Fort uh, Fort Benning, and then there I took officers training after I had gone through the basics. But then I got to go after we get, went for, through the twelve weeks of basics. I was pretty strong and, and healthy and good in good shape and went back to graduate and got there just in time. And I went on the stage and I was the first man to cross and they gave me a standing ovation because I was there in a the uniform instead of a cap and gown. They had one for me, but I didn't, didn't, didn't take time to, didn't have time to get it. So I just walked on. So that, I'm glad I did. Tour of duty was in uh, Camp House, uh, Texas as an infantry Officers and Company A, uh, Company no Company C at first, Company C, first battalion, and then uh, served there for a while. Being a soldier, that's all. It's that's being the best soldier that I knew how to be, being the best officer at that time that I knew how to be. We went to a training in in Louisiana, and from there uh, back and all all down through Louisiana, and from from then on we went to. Uh, uh, Camp House, Texas, where we walked all over Texas, I think, marched all over Texas, especially North Texas and uh, Oklahoma. From there, we went to uh, California, where we were studying to, we were plan studying, uh, we were planning uh, to train with the Marine Corps and the Navy on le loading, sh loading and dock getting on ships and going out in the o uh, out in the ocean and in getting on d down on, on those mock up thing rope things where you have to crawl up and down and when you get in one of those little boats that they ended up like in Europe when they landed with the one end going down and you got out of there and when you got out you didn't always wait get in waiting water sometimes it was over your head <laughs> and there was some very interesting things there too we we trained over on California there and that we were getting used to training to go and hit the the uh, the, uh, the land the landing landing practices that we would do in the islands where we were going over in the eastern section that was that was where we were training and President Eisenhower got news that got news that they we were a good unit and he needed a, one more good unit over there and so it went and we were taken out of Going to the islands, to then going to, to, to go to uh, France. So we loaded up in in December and headed out toward uh, the east coast. Somewhere we went all through Canada. You know, at that time it took a train ride, and you didn't know where were you going, where you were going to, because they didn't tell us where we were going. They thought that would the enemy could get a hold of it. And that would be the end of that. D-Day had been on uh, that spring, and then we went on into that, uh, uh, we entered uh, Cherbourg and got into what they call the cigarette camps, where, where you where you unload and you stay there for, uh, it's about 40 miles from the ship's area where, they, where you debark from the ship, and, and, get, and get down and, and go down into uh, this area where they're called, they named them after cigarettes, the, these areas where troop went in. Mine was, uh, I think, Old Gold's, Old Gold. And so we stayed there for about a week till they they found a place for us to go. And then we loaded on 40 and 8, those little 40 and 8 trains where you got 40 horses and 8 men. Then you had to ride from there part way, in, all the way through France and into um, 
Belgium and then Holland. And then from there we went on down and we were assigned to the to, uh, down on the Rhine. Then our activity started after we got off the train, reg regularly assigned. We were we were straight on the train twice going to, going there. It was very interesting because we had to get off the get off the train real hurry and jumped off and you know you could, it was very easy to get off all you had to do is jump and we didn't it, i couldn't make it now but at that time we were tough you could jump and then tumble you know if needed be and get in those ditches because those planes were coming over they they th thank god they gave us warning that they they were coming so they did strafe and they'd strafe some and they'd hit some people you know maybe kill some but uh, but not not too many at that time because we we got the 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 the, the shot on them a little bit because we they, we we got warned we got we took care of the warning we went down to Bonn and went for, we were already employed before we we st marched to Bonn, Germany and then there we crossed the um, Rhine River on a man-made boat you know our objective was to go on to um, join. General Patton, and that was something else, <laughs> trying to keep up with him because he would moved out. That was after the Battle of the Bulge. Then he, we, uh, uh, I remember one time he came near, and I was in charge of the platoon, and so he came, and somebody said, uh, 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 he drove up there, and we were we were held down because we were, we were uh, uh, being fired at. There was machine gun on my left and one on my right, and that was sort of enfilade fire. And and we every time anybody get up, you know, you get shot. And so uh, he, he said, who's in charge? And of course, he didn't get up close, and I said, I wasn't going to get up and, and at that time and report to him because I'd have been killed. And so I was looking after my men, and, but but we had to wait till we could get that machine gun out of the way. So the, we called him field artillery fire, and they, they took care of it. The, the main thing is that you you are you are the paid man to take care of the troops. In other words, I was a I was a enlisted man till my till I got a commission on November the fifth, nineteen forty one, and then uh, uh, then uh, uh, you're in charge of your troops and you are a master of your troops. I mean, you got to be in control. You got to you got to lead them. You got to, to uh, be a pretty much of a, a soldier to do that and my my greatest fear was that I'd let them down some way you know you don't want, I would have died before I would let them down you have to wipe out this situation you know before you can you can get uh, get get moving again and so when the thing was out we moved and we moved on down to the river uh, at at the the big cathedral in Bonn in Germany, and from there we waited a couple of days before we went over on the pontoon boats that the engineers had to put down. And they, they were the ones who had a tough job, the engineers, because they had to go in before infantry. And they had to, the only people they had was their own guards to protect them, and they had to put these ships out, there, these boats, in order for us to cross. There was one bridge at the Remagen, but, but no one could get on it because they were, they were heavily uh, uh, machine gun was pr were pretty heavy there machine gunning and and people were getting killed right and left so they they put us across at our own pl uh, boats you know the get made a bridge across there like that and that was quite something too because we were held on a bridge until we could get across out there in the middle of the the Rhine River you know till we could all get across there was some hold up over there. The enemy was firing, and we couldn't get a right away. As soon as we got off, we, it was dark. We traveled all night walking, just as fast as we could, and we got through to a little t uh, village somewhere and stopped for the night. And we were being fired at all the time, and we were sent. We sent out. Uh, we were ready to attack. We we're on attack, and so uh, we we uh, had lost a mountain. My, uh, I didn't lose any men in my platoon until <coughs> we got down near the <coughs> Don Donau River. <coughs> Excuse me. It's called the uh, 
the Blue Danube. And one one of my men was hit by, by a field artillery piece, <clears throat> an 88. Hit him direct, and it just tore him all to pieces, you know. That was very sad. Here you, you, you are on one side, and, and this young, handsome lad was over there, and he's just blown to bits. You just... Uh, uh, be the boss, and you are you are and and do what you do things a lot of times that you would not not ask them to do, or you have you commanded them to do <coughs> do something. They uh, they uh, they didn't mind doing it for me because they knew I had done it before before them, and I had protected them and the best that I could. My dear. I, the, my greatest fear was that, that I would do something stupid, and you know, it's easy to do something stupid. It really is, and it's not really stupid. It's just your your your, your greatest thing is the weather, the cold weather. You're freezing, and your mind is not all exactly right, and you're mad, and you're angry, and you you can easily do make make mistakes, and get people killed by by your own. Uh, not being able to be there in the right place or being able to take care of, of an enemy machine gun or something like that. You just have to depend on uh, runners and that kind of thing, somebody back and forth, more or less in, in a group. And you, uh, you know, have to send messages. If, if you're down, you send messages to them. And, they, uh, and sometimes you have, to, you have to get out and run yourself if you can't find the right find a person to do something. You have to move out yourself. That is, you're on the ground, you're, you know, you, most of the time, and w when you have a fighting situation, you get up and advance, you know, and, and attack as you can, and you have to hurry up about it. But we got across, everybody got across fine, and when we got over there, we, we got uh, uh, rather in in our position again, and we marched on in in the flank formation down to to the next time where we had an attack. But one of the the attacks that I remember, we were down on the Biggie River. That was after we crossed the the uh, Blue Danube, and uh, it was a our company commander. Something happened to him, and so uh, anyway, uh, the the fellow in command was didn't know what he was doing. He said, "Somebody's got to go across this." This uh, this little river is called a biggie, B-I-G-G-E, bigger river, and so it was was not really a river. It's about a stream like this, out one of these streams around here. It was not very deep, thank God, but it was frozen over and but deep enough, and it was uh, over my head. But I was I said, come on, first uh, second platoon, we'll we'll lead them across there. So I started in, and this going down this water and this icy water and breaking the ice as we go along and it was over my head in a couple of places but I got across and there was a fellow who wasn't able to swim and I said come on hold on my hand you were, you were you had your rifle and you had your your uh, pack on and you you're guiding this lad on through he couldn't swim and I was holding him up and I finally got him over and I waded on over across got got across and him across and then uh the rest of them, and I told a big big sergeant along to stand up and help the rest of them across. And I got over there and established a beachhead on the other side, and we, we got over there and finally got into our positions. And then the, the, I was glad because the, after we got over, they started to uh, uh, to, to attack us. I, I guess that was my worst worst time in the whole time. That whole night we had to be there, you know, in that freezing cold. With, with these clo wet clothing on, there were some embankments, uh, any kind of enfilade, uh, any kind of uh, weather, uh, any kind of little sink or any place like that. You got into it till you could find your way. Then we found foxholes that had already been dug, and we we landed. We got our troops. My platoon settled in that, those. The next morning we got out. We found arms and legs. Somebody had used it before, you know, and there were all body parts all about there. And we got up and we, we uh, uh, the artillery pieces had torn them apart. They were retreating and then we were, we were pushing them out, getting them out of the way. And they, they fought com 
completely on down to the end of the war. Then that we knew the war was coming, the end was coming close because they they started to the troops were surrendering and coming in big big groups with their hands up high, you know. And you have other people in my position, and I I never never thought anything about what I was what I was doing. I always just thank God that I was able to stay alive and that, that I didn't goof up and. And, and I protected my people by leading them in the way that they sh that I should have and using good tactics as well as I could and that I had been trained to do. And that was the thing that was out that helped us to, to get through it. And uh, it was, we had many bombings and, and uh, the artillery pieces were pouring in on us from time to time and we'd have to, we'd have to be stopped, you know, and, and they couldn't, couldn't advance very far. But then the scary part was you'd hear these screaming memias go over, it, you know, over your heads, and they, they really do scream. And it's, it's, a, it's an eerie, strange feeling. It, it even, even makes you scared, you know. You're already scared, and you're cold, and you're frozen, and you're mad, you know, and you're hungry, and all that kind of thing. War is hell. That, that, that it really is truly that, as you can see. The Germans then started to give up. It, 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 then, down the, after after passing over down into the south part of Germany, they started to giving up. It was not too much of a problem from then on. The SS troops were uh, through uh, in there occasionally, and they were the the mean guys. But they uh, uh, about that time they were pretty well coward. You know, and you'd seen some of the things that they did, by by uh, the uh, wounds that these men had had. You know that one place where we had our tanks had been uh, uh, stopped and captured, and and one or two of them, and the men were hanging out over them dead. You know they had. The, the burial troops hadn't gotten there to them. And it was just a terrible, terrible st a stench, you know. The smell of, of blood and bodies that have been torn apart is not a good smell. It, we went le east of Munich, and down on in, we ended up at war's end down in, in uh, 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 Salzburg. In Austria, we got way down there, and that was a great day when that when the war was. We knew it had ended, and then uh, two or three days, but we kept on going until we got down there. And when I was there, uh, we were there two days, and they uh, one person out of each regiment was called to go to to um, what was what I considered was an R and R, with rest rest. And I was, it was a school actually. They were, they were going to send us there to, to do some training for a school that would be conducted in, in, by American troops in, in Europe, in Germany. And anyway, it, it, we went to these lectures, but, uh, and, uh, and that was at Paris. We were sent to Paris. And we would, the three of us went, and one, got, one fellow became very ill at Nancy, and so uh, the, then the other guy did not show, so I took his driver and he and I went in, in into Paris. Never been there in my life. We went right on down through through Paris, down the Champs-Élysées, you know, to the headquarters, found the headquarters and found out that we were built, we were billeted in Cité Université, you know, and there we, we, we were there for two weeks. That was right immediately after the war. We uh, had a great time. We, the, all the troops went out at night. And being infantry troops, we didn't mind walking. We took the the uh, metro, that was the underground railroad, you know, to wherever we wanted to go, where all the fun was. And we'd stay out until 3 o'clock. The metro closed at 12 o'clock. So we'd have to walk home about 12 or 15 miles, but, but back to where we were billeted, I say home. It was not home. But walk back, and we'd... We'd get there after, you know, after after 
oh, way after midnight. But we didn't mind walking because that's, well, that's what we did anyway. A after I got back from that, that um, place, they, they said that since we were there, they, they, they would send us on to Dachau where we would be uh, uh, lined up with 7th, 7th Army Headquarters. So they, we got our orders cut to move out that next day, so we had to, we had to find our troops. They were up in Mannheim, moved up considerably up into France, and then from Mannheim we went to Augsburg, where the Seventh Army headquarters was, and there we were assigned, assigned to Dachau, which is the prison camp for, for the, the Jewish, uh, people essentially. It was a terrible place. It was, there were dead people on the streets yet. You know, they they would die every day. And they'd have to put them on a, a, a wagon and take them out to a common burial place. And they were, you know, went out there every day with a truckload of them. It was interesting because they used the same truck, put some some big sheets of paper across it, and the next day we, we got provisions for the for the camp for the food camps. That was quite, for, that was we used the German tanks for that. You put a big big sheet of paper across that and filled that they were this foodstuffs were in bags, German Germans for they, they were for the German uh, uh, for the prisoners and the the Jewish people who were sick in these hospitals. And that they had German crews to help me in there. And they were excellent cooks, but they made very pretty good food out of that uh, dried stuff and the ersatz coffee and whatever, you know, and that kind of thing that we had. Dried foods and real real dried cheeses that were there. And and the, the, some of the very beautiful pumpernickel German black bread that was very good. Uh, we had to keep the, keep the people who were starving away from the, our waste cans outside because they'd go, go in there and eat, eat and kill themselves. And we were trying to heal them the best we could. And we did uh, maintain uh, a good facility there for, made up of German doctors and nurses there. And SS troops were out there to serve in the camp to help to clean up the camp itself. We were all frail, and it could happen to us. Americans could, could be easily, we could be, look what they're doing down there in, in, in the where they're fighting now. All over the world, there are people being mistreated, being uh, harmed, and being s split open, and, and shot at, and their heads cut off, and beheaded, and all kinds of things that they do. But there in the, in the compound in Dachau, the, my, my unit then had moved on. They went, to, uh, went on and went to the States and got uh, uh, furlough and then uh, about uh, three weeks off and then they reunited and went down to the Philippines and they were being prepared as we were going over there to prepare to hit the islands, they were being prepared to hit Japan. And they were very glad when the the big bomb dropped because if it hadn't, they were going to have to be sent to Japan and they would have been wiped out and they know they would because of what happened in Europe. I'm, I'm so glad we, we dropped that bomb because my my dear friends and the people that I had served with would have all been dead and they they were in favor of it. Of course, there, there are others would be... Uh, the, it, it did... There are all kinds of arguments for it and against it, but our, our troops were for it because they would have been killed. And I think you would be for something if you could save your life. It's just that simple. Life is very precious to us, I think. And then when I came, when the war was over, I, I, when I got home, I got home, I stayed the, that year until uh, the rest of the year in Germany. and. In, at Dachau and help serve and clean up that. And we did a pretty mar marvelous job of bringing a lot of them to health back, but not, not totally, of course. We lost so many of them. But when I went into Germany, the, I, 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 the first day I went in, uh, um, I'm, I'm talking about at Dachau, we, we went there and, and uh, my, my buddy, 
my two buddies and I went from that were out of my unit. And we were assigned and went there. And it was uh, so, the stench was so terrible with the dead people there. And, and they, the train had been brought, uh, brought in a group of, of, of Jews from another area. And they, were, they killed them before, when they found out that Germany had, had given, surrendered, they killed them all on the train, the Germans did. And they left them there. And we didn't know it till we got there. We had to get all of those out of the train. And some of them were on top of the train. We finally see, had seen. My job was essentially to provide food. I had to go to uh, Munich with, with trucks, with trucks, with American trucks to get American foods for our soldiers who were there on, in charge of the details. You, you get used to it a little bit, you know. As you, it took me a whole week. I couldn't eat a thing, you know, and I was 28 inches in the waist when, when I got through. I could, just could not eat. Just was not, I, the stench was so bad. You had to get so inured to that smell, I guess. And finally, you know, you can't get it out all at once. As much as they try to fumigate and do all the kinds of things they did, it's just there. You could, you could not live there and not know that that was going on because the trains and the stench of the thing is, was still there. It manifests itself. And it, this could just blow over. There's a big brick wall there. Was about oh, it's uh, twelve feet high, you know. And in the in the uh, entrance, it's, it had a little sign: "Arbeit macht frei." Work makes you free. So when you come into that camp, you see that those people work. Their work did not make them free. They were they were and the uh, the crematoria there were they had burned as many of them as they could. And we, there was, the, at that place, they had the uh, little tents where the people were, were sent in to be. They told them they were going to have to take a bath They take they, to remove all their clothes, men and women alike, in the same thing. They'd put them in there and, and then turn on this gas. Had a little thing at the top. They turned it on, leave it on, and then, of course, in just no time, they would, they would be dead. This poison. There were all kinds of poisons, the gas uh, containers around, you know. After Dhaka, I was, I, uh, it was to return home, you know. I was there for a year, and then you get into a, what they call a pipeline, and that is your, your name comes up two or three months ahead of time. Then you could, they, you could, every week you'd be getting a little more anxious to go, and then finally when you, your time to go, they, they send you, they take you out of Dhaka, and they send you to a to a collecting point someplace like in and then you go from there to your back to your cigarette camps in in in, in France again and there you wait for your, your your ship home and we we rode on the little ships that the ladies made you know and riveting riveted and they were light and they were they were bouncy and that made me very seasick I, I don't think I ate a bite during that whole trip either. I was, I, and every, every time, ever since I, it took me months to watch ships like you'd go to the movie to see the Pathé News. That's the only news you could ever see at that time. Television hadn't made itself that well known. And uh, you could see that it was a very amazing thing. See what was going on through the, Pathé News, it was called. And those ships would, you know, see them. I'd see them moving along, and I'd get seasick just watching this. <laughs> so when I got, got there and got out on the ground, I reached, reached down and kissed the ground, the old dirty street there in New York City. <laughs> I, I was so glad. It was a beautiful spot in the USA. It was, had a formal just discharge when we got back about April. About, about April of 27th or 8th, somewhere along there, back in Camp uh, Shelby, Mississippi. And then you, you were a gentleman again of the United States, civilian life. Well, not, not completely. They, you have to, you're around, you maintain your sort of a status of, if you're needed, you can come back. But they never did need us. But 
I didn't think they would, but I was, you know, just sort of visited around and visited my folks and had a little fun and then got a, got a job and then uh, worked for a while and then decided to go back to school, which I did. It was wonderful. They put all my, got all my books and, and you know, bought my books, paid my tuition, didn't have to pay a cent as far as I was concerned. But then, uh, then uh, after I got out, out of that, I, I, I graduated with a master's and then went to teach at Hines College in Mississippi, junior college and high school, and I enjoyed that very much. Not right away. I worked, went well, a master's and then worked at Hines two years and then went to Susquehanna and worked uh, eight years there and got a job in Georgia. And that's when, when I came to Georgia. The, the space, the space thing, and it's that the things that it has developed for us, the things that, that we made use of because of space, surgeries and that kind of thing. I have a little pacemaker right here, and had it not been for space, I don't think I'd have had it. You know, that's, that's kind of thing. People, And there are many, many blessings that come from the space thing. And of course, television and computers, oh my, you know. And I had a computer going through school. My, and t cell phones, they're um, almost obnoxious with going through the stores and hearing someone talking behind you. And you turn around and you say, what? And they'd say, they're, 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 they're talking to someone else. Well, one thing, it proved me to be a man. I, you know, I proved my manhood. And, and that gave me a lot of confidence. And I, I just never, I had the confidence to go in and just feel as though I could take charge, if I had to, of any situation. And sometimes you do really have to do that, as you know. And I, I was, thank God I was successful in doing what I did. I went to school and worked very hard and, and studied hard and worked and went to all kinds of uh, workshops and that kind of thing to make myself better in my profession and teaching. And then I met Janet and of course we married and of course we were in the same uh, profession so music has been my life except for the military and that was almost, it was like a, bl a blackout from doing anything Anything that I did in the military was nothing at all like I did in civilian life. A hero is a person who does more outstanding things than I did. I just, I just walked the walk and did what I was supposed to do and did it to the best of my ability and I didn't get hurt or wounded or killed. The people who got killed, they were the, they were the heroes. It was real. It was real. It was, re it was tough. It was war. It would actually existed. It was a thing that uh, uh, that impacted my life uh, physically and mentally. It it's left me some thoughts that I'd uh, some things that happened that I just soon blot out because of the horrors, and that's what I tried to do mostly. That's I couldn't give a very comprehensive thing this morning of actually what we did because it's I blotted out so much of it because of the war the, itself, the fears, the, the weather. You have no idea what the coldness with seeing people with frozen feet, you know, and, they, they, and, and pneumonia and sickness and, and that kind of thing does to the, to the human body. And, and, and that is, I, I was, thank God I was able to maintain that and all of my, my parts with me. I didn't, wasn't wounded at all. So many of my friends were killed and wounded, and I didn't have any of that. Now, I wouldn't call myself a hero because of that. I was just God protected, that was all. Some wars are necessary, I know that. But they're necessary, and that was a necessary war. When I went to war, no, no man, no man himself would would be able to say stand there and say 
you know, I, I, I don't want to go to war. It would be a hard thing to be a conscientious objector. I, would, I felt sorry for them because if they did, they were, they were really looked upon with disdain. A person, I felt sorry for people who looked good, looked fine, but they, they, couldn't, have, they couldn't have done one th half of the things that I was able to do because of, of my good health. When the doctor examined me when I first went in and said, well, you'd make a good soldier, son. Go, go for it. And I said, I'll, do it. I'll give it my best with God's help. And that's what I did. The hope for America is to still to still keep our faith in in, in our in our in our abilities uh, to each other and to uh, to to speak to to do this in truth, not to go out and and declare a war when there's no need to for a war. And and I first personally feel that this this war was not needed; it was not necessary. And we were lied to about it. And I, I, I say that that was, that was terrible. We're in it and we're going to have to get out of it. And I say stay, stay the course till we get out of it. And get out of it and get back. And stay the heck away from trying to get, get into everything else. Because it will certainly happen if we don't. And yes, to keep our, keep our, uh, keep our souls and bodies true to what we believe in and what we what we think, because this is a still a great nation, a great country. It's the greatest I've seen.